Welcome, Bright Church. We're going to continue our uh, series in uh, our foundational beliefs. And today we're going to be talking about creation uh, and the nature of man. And I'm really excited about this because there's going to be a lot of things. I, I've been thinking about this for a while. And if you take a look at everything around you in this world, there is a purpose for everything. And a lot of people in their lives at this age, whatever age you're at, have figured out, here is my purpose, here is my destiny. For some people, that's breaking Guinness Book World Records, right? For some people, that is becoming a YouTube star. For other people, that's becoming a political figure, maybe. What I want you to do right now, 15 seconds, turn to your neighbor and say, ask and share, here is my purpose that I figured out so far for my life. Do that right now, 15 seconds. My purpose in life is? Okay, you shared it? Share it a little bit more deeper, because a lot of times when we're just shaking hands during greeting time, we're, yeah, hey, my name is this, but you don't share your purpose. Like, you need to share your purpose in life, right? This is what I'm about. This is what's uh, what I'm uh, trying to accomplish in my life. Well, we're going to be talking about four things today, I'm trying to answer. There's a lot of questions when it comes to creation and nature of man. We're going to try to uh, cover th four things. And if uh, you guys open up the next slide, those four things are, why create man to begin with? Why create man? Uh, accuracy of the creation account, uh, why create man with ability to sin, and then man before and after the fall. That's what we're going to talk about today. So let's dive into the very first one. Why create man? Well, if you, we take a look at the very first uh, chapter of the Bible, it says the following in verse 26. Um, God said, let, God said let, man, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the, birds of the over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creepy, creeping, creepy, creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We are created in the image of God. Now, to better understand that, at least partially, we have to consider, what do images represent here in our world? Imagine you're driving down the highway and you see a billboard with this picture. If I can have that picture. There we go, that picture right there. A picture of a car, Tesla. This, this is the new Roadster. And that picture, you can have this, part, this reaction to it. Man, I want that picture. I, that picture is awesome. That image, it's telling you something about the real thing. That image tells you about how it looks, how it drives, one, uh, and if it actually did have some, uh, you know, an advertising to it, it could say uh, 0 to 16 in 1.9 seconds, right? Something like that. You, you see an image, and you all of, a, all of a sudden have an idea about what the original is. And the image is pulling you to meet the original. You want to drive that. You want to be in that. No, you know, whatever the price is. Just, just give me a drive. That is what an image does. It displays, it proclaims, it glorifies the real thing. So when we, when we are created in the image of God, I purposely did not pick a picture for the next point. When we are created in the image of God, we are to display, proclaim how amazing, how glorious God is. And when you think about how glorious he is, here are some very specific but basic things. Do you know how we are, have you ever been in the situation when you're talking to somebody, but yet you're overhearing somebody else's conversation, or you can actually maybe even talk to two people at the same time? That interesting ability, take it to the hundred, to the infinite level of being able to hear everybody's thoughts. That is what God can do. He knows the intentions of every heart. He knows everything that we've ever said. Can you imagine a memory bank that vast? And that small ability that we have points to something amazing in God. 
you can create something, an invention, whether it's a car or whatever it is, computer, the internet, you created that, you invented that more accurately, and when you look at that which you created, it com doesn't compare anything to the human body which God created. Nothing can be compared to the human body. It's so complex and yet all of its processes are so much in harmony. I, I, I like to share this example. If you ever bruised yourself or cut yourself on accident somewhere and the healing process starts, God created, that's like an indicator that we are supposed to live forever, a healing process. And God instilled a code, a DNA code, into every single person, a specific code, and those cells start being created and closing up the wound. You invent something, God invents the human body. And, and this is amazing. Your body knows how to make more of you and not of somebody else. And your body knows when to stop. Can you imagine you have this cut and it starts healing and then this blob just continues to grow? That would be weird, right? It knows when to stop. That is an amazing, amazing creation. More things. Um, we have the ability, mathematically, probabilistically, to predict the future. Take that to the infinite level. God is already in the future. He knows the future exactly. That's amazing. Think about this. If you had someone sitting next to you that knew exactly how everything is going to be laid out, that's amazing. So when we day-to-day -day act, say, do things, we are created in God's image to proclaim, to display how amazing he is. That is a big responsibility. That is a, an amazing calling. And uh, when we read this passage in Isaiah, it explicitly says why we are created. This is why, maybe this is the purpose that you shared with your neighbor. It says in Isaiah 43, 6 through 7, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. We, you and I, were created to display the glory of God. Every single day we wake up. Yes, those eight to five days and those days that we're going to be in Shasta, right? Or is that where it's going to be? I don't know. Trinity Lake, I don't know where it is. Anyway, every single day you wake up and you're, you are an image of God. That is to proclaim and give glory to him. Now, it's not just we, ourselves, what we say, what we do, that are going to uh, that uh, glorify God, but we being amazed at God's creation get to glorify and point to God. Um, there is a lot of things. How, why is it that this world is so complex, yet, yet all of the processes are in such harmony? It's because God gets glorified. It's his. He created it. Um, have you ever, this is an amazing thing, just put yourself in this, in, in this position. Have you ever tried to command a lightning bolt? According to Job 38, 35, God says they report for duty and he sends them at will everywhere he wants, everywhere he wills. That is a, take a lightning bolt and say you're gonna go here and you're gonna strike this tree and you're gonna strike this car or whatever, right? God has that kind of authority. God tells Abraham, remember Abraham? Come out of your tent and count the stars. Now, think about this. Abraham didn't have Google. So God commands me, I have to do this. One, two, oh, I, I lost count again. Two, three, right? He can, why are there so many stars? That is pointing to the immensity of God. How incredible he is that he created so many great things and huge things and very small things. Why is it, God, that you have put specific universal constants in nature, in your creation? I'll give you just one example. At some point, going through all of the geometric figures that, I have to give you a math example, right? Going through all of the uh, different geometric figures, God decided, look, we're going we're gonna to make a circle. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to make a circle and take the circumference of that circle and if they figure out to divide it by that diameter, they're going to get a specific number. That number is going to be pi. 
let's see, what, what should we make pi be equal to? He he'd obviously, we named it pi. He didn't, might have a different name for it. Let's start with the number 3, and then 1.4, 159. You know what? We're going to make this really exciting. It's never going to end. It's just going to continue forever and ever. Why are there these specific universal constants in nature, in the cosmos, to show that God is in the details? He really cares, and he says, look, I've designed everything from the smallest, smallest particle to the vastness of our cosmos to glorify his name. And we, witnessing this, are to glorify him and display that glory. Why is it that we have all of these senses, the way we hear? I mean, think about this. I'm, I'm actually vibrating a medium called air, and those vibrations are getting into your ear, there is bones that are vibrating, eventually get into a cochlea, an organ that actually has little hair follicles in it, and those hair follicles move because of those vibrations, and electrical signals are sent to our brain, and we make sense of it. That, why? To glorify God. And that, this is how we have scientifically kind of addressed this. This is what happens and how we hear. How we see is even more amazing, right? How, why do we have all these senses? To experience God's creation and say, this is amazing, Lord. This is all your work. This is about you. Psalm 19, 1 through 4 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. You being an image of God, is that what you are doing? Are you proclaiming, displaying God, how amazing God is through what you do, say, and think? Now a question comes up, why is it that God is, why is glory so important to God? And we get a, a little glimpse of this, an answer, again in Isaiah in chapter 48. Verses 9 through 11, he says, For my name's sake I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have not tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will give to no other. My glory I will not give to another. Creation, creator will always be more amazing than creation. Somebody invents something, you would, be, you would be making a horrible mistake in coming up to that invention and saying, whoa, this is amazing, you are amazing, I can't believe this, it, completely ignoring the inventor. You come up to a piece of artwork and you're like, wow, you start giving compliments to the artwork, that's a horrible mistake, if the, especially if the artist is standing next to you, because it's the author that gets the credit, right? Think about this. You come into a house, a newly built house, and you start complimenting, wow, this wall is stro so straight, house. I love the, the plan. I love the sink. I, I love the tile work and all this. No, who, who gets the glory? Who gets the credit? The designer, the builder, the architect. That's the person because they created it. It was theirs, their idea, and it belongs to them. So when when we address this question of why it's important, why is God's glory so important, it's because this whole world is his. He created it. He gets credit for it. We, there, a person who does not give credit to God is missing the mark. And so think about this. Like yesterday, I was driving. I don't know if anybody has seen the sunset yesterday. Anybody see the sunset? When you are amazed at the sunset, and you stop there and do not give glory to God for that painting that he painted that evening, you are missing the mark on what it means to glorify God for his creation. When you see a kind deed being done towards you or you do be doing, doing that kind deed, if you are just thanking that person and not giving glory to God, not addressing him, you are missing the mark on what it is to display God's glory, to proclaim God's amazing character. Some words of caution, though. It might sound like, well, if it wasn't for us, God might not get any glory. Complete heresy. 
God doesn't need for us to display him. He is perfect. He is amazing all by himself. Within the Godhead, the Trinity, they experience unity unlike any other unity. And they are content with their relationship. They do not need our praise. So the only person that is at a loss is us when we do not glorify God. When we do not proclaim how amazing he is. Don't think also, here's another point, do not think that God created us because he was alone. Again, he was, he has, he's in the triune Godhead. He, he is, has a community with, in which he fellowships from eternity past. Being perfect in nature, he does not need anything. If he did, if he felt lonely, that means he is not God. He is not perfect. God created us as a gift to see, to show, and to savor his glory. Now, so if you understand just that bit, think about this. I love this. John Piper shared this in a message. If you understand that bit, that everything was created for God's glory, then you know something about everything. Think about this. You know something about everything there is in this world. In fact, you know the most important thing there is about everything in this world, that it is to proclaim, to display God's glory and how amazing God is. You, me, everybody included. So through this life, as we see acts of heroism, uh, kindness, whether it's on our life or whether it's fiction or nonfiction, all of that is to point to God and his glory. And he deserves, he rightfully deserves it. When we were uh, in Portland, uh, Oregon last week visiting family, uh, David's running through the park in a forest. And I've been trying to, my very best, try to instill certain biblical truths in him. Like the fact that God created everything. And sometimes these things randomly come out of him. Imagine this. He's running through a forest in a huge park, and he's looking at this, and he literally screams out, Wow, God, God created all of this. A little child says that, and I was like, whoa, this is amazing. That he even thought about this. A, a child is praising God that this is all of his. He created this. When us, hum, us adults are running through the park, what were we thinking? David, be careful. Don't fall. Be, make sure, look at that rock. Look at that bench, right? Make sure you don't hit anything. When we, actually, that's a good question to ask. Do we have... When was the, the last time you had a continuous day when moment after moment, hour after hour, whatever experiences you had, you gave glory to God? This is, you, you get the credit for this. Good or bad, God, you get the credit. You were amazing how you created this event or that situation. We could also ask a more specific question. We are created for God's glory, but why this specific world? Why the suffering? Why, why this plan? The answer to that we find in Ephesians. The pinnacle, the apex of God's glory, I want to submit to you, is the grace of God that we just sang about. The grace of God is the highest point of what we can glorify God for. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, I'll read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, listen to this, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. There's more verses I can share with you. I'll share one more. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God, from eternity past, wanted us to see his glory and to witness it, and he has revealed it in the face of Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. He wanted us to experience grace. Now, um, just as we read in Ephesians uh, chapter 1 here, 
He's planned this from the very beginning. He wanted this to be the plan, that his grace gets the glory. There's all these other attributes that obviously get, uh, that through which he gets the glory, but he gets glory through us experiencing grace. I'm going to actually push this a little step further. There is this thing called a limit process. Maybe some of you have heard about this. I'll step back a little bit. Imagine I take and go the dist halfway the distance between me and the pulpit once, and I keep doing this again and again, again and again. I know what the limit is. It's the pulpit, right? But theoretically, if I just keep taking half the distance towards the pulpit, I'm theoretically never going to touch the pulpit, right? I mean, I won't be able to move my, my foot so infinitesimally small, but there is a limit. God has created an, a being in his image to come in knowledge of him infinitesimally close. We get to understand the attributes and experience the attributes of God unlike any other of his creations. Unlike You are in a spe very special place, you and I, because we get to experience grace by the Bible's account, nobody else gets that. The angels that were cast down, they don't experience grace. In fact, in 1 Peter, it says, they long to look at how salvation, how is this even possible that God forgives? God, you are holy. We have never seen somebody so powerful, so right and just, be able to come up with a plan that puts people in a dead end and by his own sacrifice would be able to get them out of that dead end by his grace. So you and I are in a special place. That supreme attribute that God has, that we can glorify him, unlike any other of his creations, is his grace. We are able to experience that grace, and we would be able to glorify him for that grace. Romans 5, 2 says the following. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace into which we, in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I want to ask you today, what is, what, are, what is it that you're hoping for? What is it that is your most precious treasure? This verse says that our hope should be in seeing God complete, in his glorified, ultimately glorified state. We can't see that right now. We'll talk about sin and how that entered the world in just a second. But our hope is to see God face to face in all of his glory. Is that what you are looking forward to? Is that what you wake up in the morning and say, look, this day I'm going to display God in his glory as best I can, but what I'm hoping for is I want to see God face to face. I want to see that glory. Just like Moses said, and he wasn't able to see the whole thing, uh, all of it. I want to see your glory, Lord. I want to see, show me your glory. That is what we have been created for. To display, to show, to proclaim every single day through what we do say and think how amazing God is, how amazing he created everything, the situations that we go through, his wisdom. I don't have enough time. I could share example after example of things in my personal life, I have the Bible, about how wise God is. It's amazing how all these attributes in one being, are, are, all of them are found in one being. Well, I want to address the next question. The next question is, well, we have this account of how creation happened. We have the Bible saying we are created for his glory, but how, how are we sure that this is actually what happened? There was an Adam, there was an Eve, and so forth? I want to address this question, the following, because there's, there's questions here that we can address, old earth, young earth. Um, there's open-handed questions. Here I'll, here's how I'll address this. There's open-handed questions, right? That uh, Salvation doesn't depend on these questions. Like, were there animal death, deaths before the fall of man? Yes or no? You could have arguments for or against the uh, animal deaths before or after uh, the fall of man, right? But it, was there an Adam? Is he a historical figure? Was there a fall, a, a point of disobedience? Yes, yes, and yes. Closed-handed question. You do not give up that position. And how, what argument can we make that the account, the first uh, account of how... Uh, 
everything came to be is actually accurate and true? Well, if we read a, several passages I'd like to uh, expose you guys to about what Jesus says. Jesus says in Matthew 19 the following. Matthew 19, verse 3. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read... Did you, do you realize that Jesus read the, all of the Old Testament? Have you not read, meaning he read it, have you not read that he who created them, he who created them, God, from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Do you see the, the words that are underlined? It's interesting how Jesus gives credit to God saying these things. He said, he who created them and said. If you actually go look back in Genesis, that second phrase, there is, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and two shall become uh, one flesh. That is what Moses said. And so Jesus is saying, all of that has been inspired by God. God said these things. And so with that passage, and with others I can uh, expose you guys to, uh, Jesus quotes Moses' Um, so, in this passage, Jesus quotes Moses, but gives credit to uh, the Creator. The Creator said these things. So, what he's saying is, Adam was real, Eve was real, because those words, Adam, actually, the word man can be uh, interpreted or read as Adam in uh, the Hebrew. In Matthew 23, 35, Jesus recognized Abel, right? One of the sons of Adam, uh, of Adam, um, He's a real person whose blood was shed. Matthew 24, 37 through 39, Jesus refers to the Noah's flood. And he says, look, my coming back, and he uses Noah's, uh, the situation with Noah and the flood, how people didn't, uh, weren't ready, and they just went on with the rest of their lives as uh, Noah was building the, the ark. And they didn't realize this, but that day came when the floodwaters came and the rain started, and they we, were not ready. We don't know what to do. And Jesus uses Noah and claims this is what happened then, and this is what's going to happen when the Son of Man comes back. People will not be ready. So when Jesus actually quotes passages from Genesis, he says all of these things happen. So the argument goes like this. You... You and I have to prove that Jesus is God because he died and was resurrected and fulfilled all of these prophecies. And God himself says all of the accounts in Genesis are true. This is what actually happened. That's a very simple one of the ways that you would say Genesis, everything that's written in Genesis is an accurate account because who says it's accurate? Jesus, God himself, in the flesh here on earth. And we have this recorded here. So... We've gone through why are we created. We've gone through uh, how accurate is the creation account. Why create man with the ability to sin? Why is it that God decided, okay, we're going to give this person a will, and that will could go against me? There's a couple ways to approach this question. One of the ways that you can approach this question uh, is uh, to compare to other beings. And this goes back to glory again. Think about this. In eternity past, there was a moment when who we call Satan now, an angel, rebelled in pride against God, taking other angels with him, and were cast down millisecondly. They were cast down from God, and all of the angels that didn't follow Satan, that is probably one of the reasons that they are now proclaiming, holy, 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 you are unique. You are not like anybody else. Look how powerful and strong you are because of what happened in eternity past with Satan and the angels that followed him. Now, compare. They are praising him for his holiness. They, have n they know and see that these angels will not experience um, any grace, any mercy. They don't know what it is. There's no understanding of what mercy and grace is. And so... When we approach the creation of man, it comes back again to glory, glory uh, for God's grace. So when he created uh, people, we already read from the beginning, he wanted 
his grace to be glorified. He's, he, he knew that there has to be a point where I have to show my grace. He wanted this. He decided that way. That's one possible explanation. We read in Romans 11.32, it says, For God has consigned, shut up, put in, all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. That is God's decision. He said, there is not a single person that is going to end up being righteous before me so to have mercy on all. I want to display my grace and mercy. There's another way, and this one might be a better explanation. We are created in God's image, right? If we are created in God's image, that means these attributes, these uh, characteristics that God has, namely a free will to decide, he chose to put into uh, his image bearers. We who carry the image of God have a will. We decide things. And in creating that will, this, is actually a point, uh, this actually points to the fact that he wants a real relationship with us. He wants a relationship that this I react to him and say, yes, by my own free decision, I want to have this relationship with him. Uh, there is a story that Rabbi, Z Rabbi Zacharias uh, shared that I really like. Uh, this one person fell in love with this gal. And he was trying to uh, find out how is it, how, how, how can I show her that I really love her? And he showed several different ways and no response. Gals, you know, take, take a point on this. He, one way, a second way. And he did the unthinkable. He went into one of those shops, uh, where uh, a fortune teller shops, and said, look, I want somehow to make this woman fall in love with me. She's not falling in love with me. I'm falling, I fall in love with her, but she hasn't fallen in love with me. And the fortune teller says, you know what, I have a pill just for that. But you have to make sure that she, that you are the first person that she sees after she takes this pill. So, Somehow, he musters up his, all this confidence to say, hey, will you go out on a date with me? And during that dinner, while she wasn't looking at that table, he puts the pill in there, she takes a drink, and the first person she sees is him. She sees is him. And she falls madly in love with him. She becomes so interested in him. She becomes just, when are we going to get married? You know, like one of those interested. She, they got married. The, their life Everything is so amazing. She takes care of him so well, cooks. She, um, I mean, everything that he can imagine, she is madly in love with him. They live several years. And one morning, he wakes up. And he knows what's going to happen. He, he's gonna, he knows she's going to wake up right next to me, and she's going to ask me, honey, what would you like for breakfast? She's going to make me breakfast. We're going to have an amazing time, heart-to-heart -heart talk. We are already in such unison, in such unity, talking about very personal things about each other. We have such a close, a very deep relationship. And he's laying there and he's thinking, he's second-guessing that love. Is it the pill or does she actually love me? Was it the pill that I gave her so many years ago or does she actually love me? God did not want to have that question, did not want to ask that question. He wanted to be sure Yes, this person, I'm going to have this person decide for themselves. They want a relationship with me. Do they really want a relationship with me? I'm going to display my grace, my love, all of this creation. If they decide they want a relationship with me, I want to be sure that love is true love. God wanted to make sure, and there, therefore he created man with the ability to choose just like he does. He chooses things. So being created in God's image, we are able to choose certain things. Now, um, we have to now address the choices that people make. And now we have to address this last question. Man before and after the fall. What's the difference? What went on? What were the responsibilities? What were the things that uh, uh, happened before the fall and after? As we read... We, people, man, Adam, was created in God's image. He was created with an eternal soul. He was given instructions. You decide what you're going to plant, what you're going to build. You get to name the animals. You are going to be somewhat autonomous. You are going to have dominion. You're going to, have, you're going to be able to subdue the earth. You're going to make plans that I'm going to be okay with 
because you're going to cultivate this land and fill it and populate it. So God made man, and before he made uh, man, he made this decision. I'm going to give this authority to man because he's made in my image. We read uh, in uh, Genesis 1, I'll read verse 28 in Genesis 1, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, listen to these powerful words, and subdue it and have dominion over the flesh, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of, hev- of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You and I get to have dominion over all of that. To subdue it. At least that's what he told Adam in the beginning. And for all of this to happen, Adam was given a uh, helper. He was given a helper to populate, to help subdue, to have dominion over this, to make these decisions. Hence, think about this, husbands. Your wife has given you to help you make decisions, right? I am so blessed with a wise wife. You know, like when, when I need some advice, that's the person you go to. That's the first person you, I always go to ask, hey, what do you think about this? And she has a big picture because she was created after, right? She was created this more, more uh, exquisite, more wise, more perfect. All of the laws that pertain in the uh, Torah pertain mostly to men, right? Because women are more perfect. Okay, I'll, I'll stop that now. <laughs> when... He created the helper. He instilled in this relationship yet another piece of his just amazing attributes. God can create. His powerful word, he says something, and that becomes reality. When's the last time you said something and that's what happened? Especially when you're raising kids, right? That's not what happens. He said something and it happened. It actually took form It was created from nothing became matter. He created man from the ground and breathed his spirit to make him alive, a soul that is alive. And he gave man the ability to create. This is an interesting thing. We realize that God makes the decision when we were born, into which family we we were born, at what time, all of these decisions God decided, right? But look at this. God decided to get put us in the creation process. Just like he creates, we are able to bring new beings into this world as well. That's amazing. He said, I want my image bearers to be co-creators with me. That is an amazing position to be in. And all of the responsibility that comes with that. So he created this. He decided um, that this world is going to be a gift, and you, your authority in this world is going to be a gift for your enjoyment. God designed a place, and he put man in a a garden, Adam. Let's talk about just Adam and Eve now. He put them in a garden. He planted a whole bunch of trees, beautiful garden. And he decided, he planted two specific trees and told them something about them. He planted them in the midst of the garden, which can be translated like in the middle, right? And he said, He didn't give any instructions about the tree of life, which assumes eat of it, but he did give an instruction about this other tree that he planted, the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. He says, don't eat of it. For the the day that you eat of it, what? You shall surely die. Your Your eternity will come to an end at an undisclosed time. You shall surely die. Now, there's a question that comes up. You know, why did God put the... the, um, the, the tree in the middle. Why did God even do this? Some, some people answer, well, um, he's testing Adam, testing his obedience or cultivating obedience in him, which are correct answers, I agree, but it doesn't seem to be giving the full picture of what that represented in the Garden of Eden. Imagine this. I buy my son, David, Legos. And I tell him, look, you can create anything you want. Create, and he, he's into like cars, so he has a lot of wheels right now, putting making these weird tanks and all this stuff. You can create anything you want. Surprise me. But you cannot leave any of your Legos in the hallway. And it said that sternly, right, so that he understands. No Legos in the hallway. What is that? Yes, I'm testing his obedience. I'm bringing his, up his obedience in him. But I'm, it's implied in what I say that 
I am the authority in this household. I say, I, I decided this is my house. I am deciding this rule. And because I am the, the, author, the, the highest authority, I am the creator, I get to decide, uh, and you need to respect that. When God says, don't eat of it, one way to think about this is, look, you are creation, but don't forget that I am the creator. You have been created. You have all this freedom. You have all of this uh, power to do so many things with what I've created. But don't forget, I am the creator. I have ultimate authority. So we don't know how long it took for them not to eat. Uh, but we see that it probably didn't take them too long, right? Like the next chapter after they eat the fruit. In fact, another point, another, another something that points to the fact that it wasn't a long time because they didn't have even any children, right? The fir their first children were after they had sinned. So however long there was time, however uh, much time has passed, it wasn't a long time. But when the uh, devil deceived Eve and then she gave it to uh, her husband who was with her, I'm not going to play this out for you guys, but you're standing right next to her, and she eats that forbidden fruit. There's, there's a, I would probably, it'd be nice to ask, what were you thinking, right? But the length of time that it took, and if you put yourself in those shoes, and I'm going to try to, and if this beautiful woman is giving you a piece of fruit, you're probably like, Oh, okay, I'll take it, right? He knew, he was the one that was directly told not to eat. And then when he was walking around in the garden and just, I mean, imagine this, that which God said, do not eat of this, was supposed to be, down, put, uh, was supposed to be passed down from one person to the next to the next. And so I can imagine Adam just giving a tour of uh, the Garden of Eden, and when they came up to that tree, he's told Eve, Eve, look, God said, do not eat of it. You know what? Don't even touch it. Don't, just don't come up to it. Don't even touch the tree. And there was a time when they not only touched it, but ate of it. And the first thing that came into their mind was shame. Shame. That is the result of sin. When disobedience entered into humanity, by their own will, by their own choice, they took it. Yes, being deceived, but they decided, I want it this way. I want to be like God, no good and evil like God, and I would possibly would make even a better God. That's what basically Satan said. Satan it was saying, you might even be a better God than God is. When they took that, shame entered them. Blaming others entered them. We see that when God comes and he says, where are you? And when he says to Eve, what have you done? Actually, when I think about this some more, you, there's different ways that God has, could have said that. He knew this was going to happen. He could have said, do you realize what you've done? What does sin bring into our lives? We don't want to take responsibility for our shortfalls. We don't want to take responsibility for all the wrongdoing that we say, that person's wrong. It's, I did it because of this, because of my parents, because of a political system, because of my culture, because I, it's not me. You made the decision. It was you. You wanted to do whatever, say whatever, go wherever. And sin, when it actually takes a, a hold of us, the result is we start blaming other people. There's shame there's not this freedom. Also, God said, remember what the law was? The law was this. The day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Think about this. Try to put yourself in Adam's shoes. When he was created, there are promises about, look, Adam, I'm going to teach you this. Let's talk about this today. There was fellowship with God. And that understanding that I'm going to live for eternity, forever, was being embedded day after day after day. And then, after the fall, after that, piece, uh, that moment of disobedience, there is going to be an undisclosed point. I'm not going to know when it is, but I'm going to terminate. I'm going to die. That sends fear. Sin will cast fear into our lives, into our souls. There are so many things that 
that sin destroys. There was this crack in the cosmos when that disobedience happened. It destroyed all of the relationships. Violence entered. We know, see, the, their two sons, what happened with Adam and Eve's uh, two sons? One killed the other. A violence entered into humanity. And this has been going on year after year, century after century, where people are deciding for themselves to their own advantage how they want to run their life. Ignoring the creation of God, ignoring God's plan, ignoring God, period, because they are the ones on the throne of their hearts deciding how their life is going to be run. They, a lot of people, yes, we're going to die soon. They already agree with that. But while I'm alive, I'm going to make most of this life. Live it how I want to live it. And that, that's the, the problem. And when those, here's the main problem I want to address when sin comes in. We understand that we have faults. We understand that we mess up. But here's the number one problem that if we do not address this with God's grace, just coming to God through Jesus, through his sacrifice, we will be suffering day after day after day of all the consequences that sin has brought into humanity. Here's what the problem is. The problem is this. You and I are problem solvers. That's also something that God is. He's a problem solver. Look how he solved our sin. And the way that we want to solve the sin in our life is the following way. You know, right now I made this mistake. But in the future, a future me is not going to make this mistake. I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be more reserving. I'm going to be just wise in the future. And so we calm ourselves with this thought that a future version of me will be able to please God, will be able to solve all of the problems in our lives. Let me, let me ask you a question. Isn't that what you were thinking about 10 years ago? You had problems 10 years ago, right? I had problems 10 years ago. I had things that I, I did, I, I had to repent of, I had to think about. Why is this happening in my life? And at that moment, I, I kid you not, I had that kind of thought. You know what? Time will pass, and I'll get this down. I won't be able to, I won't do this, I won't be able to do this. I know I, I will be able to not sin this way. You were in that position as well. How are you doing? Do not rely on a future version of you to be able to please God. You will never, ever be good enough for God. That's why Jesus Christ came. Nobody, nobody after the fall would be able to please God. And so that is why we know of only one person, only one person who came into this world, Jesus Christ, and he lived a righteous life at the level of desires. He did not desire once to do evil, to desire sin. Not once. He lived an obedient life, and here's what happens. You and I, there will become a moment, maybe this year, maybe by the end of this month, maybe an accident today, where you or I will come before God. And no matter how good we are, no matter what we do, whatever, whatever we did in life, it's not going to measure up to what God expects. The only, this is why faith is so amazing. The only way to be righteous in God's courtroom is to appeal to what Jesus has done. Jesus has done on the cross, paid for every single sin, past, future, past, present, and future. He has paid for everything, and he says in that courtroom, this person and I have a relationship. Father, this person has been paid for. This person knows me. This person has been adopted into our family. This person is righteous. I give him my righteousness. That's what our trust and our faith is based on. We are hoping that when we stand before God, the only, the only way that's been provided to become right with God, to not experience all of the wrath because we are held accountable, the only way not to experience God's wrath, and if you read Revelations, there are trumpets and there are bowls of wrath that are like un, unlike any other suffering that 
anybody has experienced on this planet. And that wrath is coming. The only way to not experience that wrath is to hope, to build that relationship with Jesus so that when you stand before God, Jesus says, that person knows me. I know that person. He is part of our, she is part of our family. She is righteous. He is righteous. And I, I just want to address this, the, sin, the, the craziness of sin in our, uh, uh, in our society, in our world. This has been going on for a long time. We have been so used to planning our own life that when, even when we experience, we give our life's agenda over to, uh, to God and say, look, you tell me what to do. Even then, when the Holy Spirit enters in, we are so used to making decisions by ourselves that we don't even listen to the Holy Spirit. Look, this is what this passage says. Or you should, should say this right now. Or you can go here right now. The first church, the first believers, imagine, right? Uh, Philip, the Holy Spirit, you should go on that road. Go walk. And he met somebody, and that person believed, and then gospel took, a, uh, took off in a different direction, in a new geographical region, right? There are, there are so many things that are wrong because of sin in our life. And I, I plead with you, do not compare yourself to others. We know of really bad people in this world. I can, Hitler, right? Think about this. If it wasn't for God's common grace suppressing the evil in this world, you and I would make Hitler look like a choir boy with the evil in our hearts. If it wasn't for God's great common grace suppressing this evil, having the Holy Spirit do his work through the church here right now, through Jesus on the cross, there is no hope that evil would just expound exponentially until we just destroy ourselves. Think about where we've, got, where we've come from God, the Garden of Eden to nukes in every single country waiting to just flip a switch, destroy everybody. Self-annihilation. Isn't that pathetic? That's where sin leaves. And the only way is to just, just think about how God wisely, how God in an amazing way provided a way out. He provided the only way out. There's no other way that has been provided for us. Jesus died on the cross for your and my sins so that when we trust in him with the rest of our life, we'd be able to glorify God every single day with what we say, do, uh, and think. I want to ask you guys these rapid-fire questions in the very end. Think about these. Do you take time to be in awe of God, his attributes, his creation, and give him credit for it directly or by sharing with somebody? Think back through this week or this month. What has been your priority? What has been your most prized treasure? Is God's glory being fully revealed, you seeing God's glory, your most prized pre treasure? You, what you really hope for? That's actually an indicator of how much you love him, right? If you hope to see God's glory and display it and proclaim it, that's an indicator of how much you are in love with God and with Jesus. Is the good news the sweetest news for your guilt-ridden soul? Is that the most amazing news that you have an account to give before God for your sin and Jesus is the one that has taken care of all of that sin? Lastly, what is going, what's going to change in your daily life so that you will display God's glory? I want to invite you guys to stand. I'll give you a moment. We have talked about creation, these four questions. If there is anybody today that have realized that they do not have a relationship with Jesus, I beg and plead with you. This life is like a mist. That's what our life is like. It's like dust. It's like a vapor. It's like grass that will come up and just wither right away. All of that just indicates that our lifespan is so short. I beg and plead, do not cast away eternal questions when you can give God the glory and experience it on a daily basis. I'm going to give you some time to respond in prayer. I'd like to invite the worship team up as well. Let's pray.
our Heavenly Father, our Creator, you created every single cell in our body, every single cell of this universe. Everything is yours. You created it. You own it. You govern it. And we, Lord, a lot of times have the audacity to say no to you. We are so feeble and we can die in a moment's notice. And yet you have put your image, we are your image bearers, and we really, Lord, we really want to be giving this glory and displaying it, Lord, every single day. Please, Lord, help us to be in your word, to understand all of these attributes about you and how you've embedded them into nature and into us, into the relationships, into uh, the work that we've done or that we can do. You decided that we will work even before the fall. And we want to enjoy that work, Lord, the work that you've called us to, showing love, saving lives, studying you, Lord. Help us to do this out of a clean and earnest heart to see your glory, to see your awesomeness being displayed. Lord, and if there are those people here that have no relationship with you, they have not even started thinking about eternity. I beg and plead, do a work by the Holy Spirit in their hearts that they would find this relationship with you, that they would cast all their, that you would cast all their fear out of their heart because the sweetness of your grace is so amazing that you told us, you guarantee by Jesus' death and resurrection that you love us in spite of what we do in the future. When we come running to you as children asking for forgiveness, you hold us in, our, in, in your arms and you forgive us. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. And what we're really looking forward to is to see you face to face. That's the most desired thing that we have is to see the creator of our soul face to face so that we can give you glory and be in your presence for eternity and continue to be co-creators with you. Your name be praised in everything that we do. And right now, as we sing praises to you, Lord, May this be a pleasing aroma to you. Your name be praised in everything. Amen.